Good afternoon and welcome to the 2022 Tufts Food Symposium. My name is Alex Blanchette. I'm the Acting Director of Environmental Studies here at Tufts. And I do apologize right when we started this webinar, a bunch of construction started in my backyard. So hopefully it won't stay on too long. But given the long and ongoing history of using and frankly abusing animals to displace people and colonize lands, it is especially important to begin by acknowledging that Tufts four campuses are located on unceded land of the Massachusetts, Wampanoag, Pawtucket, and Nipmuc peoples. And that moreover, our Medford campus was itself part of a colonial plantation known as Ten Hills Farms that was cultivated by enslaved African laborers. These histories endure in the displacements, oppressions, and extractions that are inherent to industrial food and meat systems as some of our panelists may note today. Before previewing the format of today's discussion panel, I would first like to turn it over to the Dean of Academic Affairs for Arts and Sciences, Heather Nathans, for a brief welcome. Hi everyone, it's such a pleasure to be here today. My name is Heather Nathan, She Series, and I am one of the Deans of Academic Affairs, as well as one of the Associate Deans for Diversity and Inclusion in the School of Arts and Sciences at Tufts. And I wanna thank Alex for his land acknowledgement. On behalf of ANS, we're proud to host the 2022 Food Symposium, which reflects the growing curriculum in food studies and nutrition science at Tufts University. And since we expanded the arts and sciences programs and food systems in 2017, we have seen these tracks swell to include some 20 distinct courses that provide an intellectual home to over 50 majors and minors at any given time. As you all know, the study of food is an inherently interdisciplinary pursuit. Events like this one, which integrate the schools of nutrition, veterinary medicine, engineering, liberal arts, offer a model for how to bring our campuses into dialogue on issues of shared concern like food production, equitable access, ethical values, and environmental sustainability. And at the outset, we wanna offer our thanks to two Tufts alumni siblings, Daphne Hope Cunningham and Ron Roland Hope, whose generous support for the environmental studies program has enabled it to expand in new directions in campus education and programming, including today's symposium. So I'm very much looking forward to the conversation to come. I apologize in advance that I have to bow out a little early I'm conducting a job interview with someone. As somebody else said before we kicked off, it's a busy Dean day, but I'm so delighted to be here for the first hour of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. I also wanna take a moment to thank the many, many, many people here at the university who have helped environmental studies organize this event, including colleagues from the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy, Tisch College, the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine, the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, and students in the arts and science class practicing in food systems. I want to give a special shout out to the Hope Cunningham Professor of the Practice, Kevin Cody, and Friedman School Master's student, Emily Sanderson, whose efforts built out the majority of today's symposium. So the Tufts Food Symposium is an event that has since 2017 functioned as an annual in-person meeting that brings the different campuses together for dialogue and debate on pivotal issues, such as most recently, the potential intersections and tensions between food tech and food justice. In building this year's open-ended virtual symposium on meat, we wanted to feature a range of practitioners, organizers, and academics who are located at very different positions on these issues, but who may also have unexpected and hopefully provocative perspectives on what meat is in the first place and the question of its future in food systems. Following some introductions, the format of today's discussion is that each speaker will give a short seven minute presentation. We asked each person to answer two questions. What is the significance of meat to your work or projects? And second, what values inspire your approaches to meat? Following these brief presentations, we will have a moderated discussion followed by a round of audience questions. Now, if you in the audience have any questions at any time, please post them in the Q&A box on Zoom, not in the chat. 
We have a crew of moderators with some expertise on these issues who will do their best to handle informational and questions. If you have questions for all of the panel to jointly discuss, we will try to forward them on. This conversation will be recorded and a link will be made available to all who registered after. But I also wanna know that all, I, I acknowledge that all ideas come from somewhere. Though we have long wanted to examine animals and food in some way in this venue, in this symposium, and indeed many of us in the social sciences actually work on issues with American meat, a major inspiration to do today's event was the receipt of a large USDA grant by engineering researchers at Tufts to host the National Institute for Cellular Agriculture. And with that, I would like to call on Professor David Kaplan to offer a brief introduction to the array of activities and research happening in the Kaplan Lab in the School of Engineering. Uh, thanks very much, Alex, and uh, thanks for having me on for a couple of minutes. Um, great to see everyone here and um, really pleased just to introduce with a minute or two of what we're trying to achieve in this program. If you're not fully cognizant of what we mean by cellular agriculture, the idea is growing meat from the cells that come from uh, the various species that are normally used as livestock, fish, and other uh, sources, but growing the food without the animals. So all we start with are some cells, and then we go from there to scale up in the laboratory and on into industry. The motivation behind our center is to really fill the gap between the amazing sort of um, impact that industry has had over the last three to five years in terms of the growth of cellular agriculture. Well, now, we're now well over 100 companies in growing uh, around the world. Uh, at the same time, there's been almost no academic research to underpin the field and provide a foundation. So the motivation for this uh, five-year USDA grant is for the team of investigators to fill that void, to provide peer-reviewed data that covers everything from consumer views of cellular agriculture to sustainability and sustainability analyses, whether it's LCAs or TEAs, techno-economic analysis, uh, filling in as well the scientific data in terms of cell sourcing, cell characterization, cell storage and use, and many, many other activities. Um, along with this, we're building an educational platform. So we already have a couple of courses that are taught for our undergraduate students here at Tufts in Cell Ag, one lecture, one lab, always oversubscribed, which is a great sign. Uh, and we've also recently had approval for a four course graduate certificate program in cellular agriculture, the first of its kind in the world. So we're excited to see the education uh, growing. We're, we're seeing the science and engineering growing. Uh, and this is a activity that comes from both uh, the engineering school at Tufts and our nutrition school at Tufts, as well as five other partnering academic institutions. That includes UC Davis, Virginia Tech, uh, Virginia State, UMass, Boston, and MIT. So be, I'd be happy to chat with anyone with, uh, that would like further details. We do have a website that'll go live in about two weeks where you can read more uh, and follow-ups would be welcome. So thank you very much, Alex, for the couple of minutes to introduce the program and we look, look forward to further communications. Thank you. Sorry, it's my pleasure and it's exciting times. Thank you, David. Without further ado, our moderator for this event is Danielle Nirenberg, a world-renowned researcher, speaker, and advocate on, on all issues relating to food systems and agriculture. In 2013, Danielle co-founded Food Tank with Bernard Pollock, a nonprofit organization focused on building a global community for safe, healthy, and nourished eaters. Food Tank aims to be a global convener, thought leadership organization, and creator of unbiased original research impacting the food system. And Danielle is also notably a graduate of the Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. Please take it away, Danielle. Thank you so much. And I wanna thank David, Heather and Alex. It's really an honor to be here. I'm always happy um, to, I wish I could be there in person, but it's always uh, really exciting to be back at Tufts. 
Uh, and I'm really excited for this discussion that we'll be having today around unpacking meat. Um, I started my career right after Tufts looking um, at the growth of industrial animal operations or factory farms around the globe and the impact that they have on communities, on water and air pollution, on the, uh, on the economy, and of course on animal and human welfare. And I learned that we can raise farm animals in a way that where they can perform their natural behaviors and contribute to environmental sustainability and the economic sustainability of communities. And I'm also, you know, really excited to be learning more because I'm a Tufts nerd about some of the new innovations and technologies in the meat sector, including alternative proteins and cultured meat. We have a really cool group of experts who we're going to hear from today, people who are working in different ways to change how we raise, grow, and cultivate meat in different ways. There are also real thinkers and doers who understand the challenges and obstacles we face because of the environmental and social justice impacts of our current methods of meat production. As we know, the pandemic unveiled a lot of injustice in our food systems and particularly in meat processing. Uh, these problems have always been there, but not evident uh, to most of the general public. Now we can't unsee them, and, and I think that's a good thing. And we can't unsee the systemic racism, inequity, and injustice that has been inherent in food systems particularly in, in, in our, our meat uh, systems around the globe. So I'm going to introduce all of our speakers briefly, and of course you can find out more about them all online. First, it's my pleasure to introduce Rid Shin. He is the co-founder and CEO of Big Picture Beef, which was launched to produce Northeast grass-fed beef for con uh, consumers in the Northeastern United States. So thank you for being here, Ridge. I'm also pleased uh, to have uh, Magali Licoli, who is the executive director and co-founder of Ensoremos, a human rights worker-based organization that works to ensure the dignity of poultry workers. She recently spoke at an event Food Tank had at South by Southwest in Austin, and she was really amazing. She's one of my superheroines. Um, so thanks for being here. We also have Alicia Kennedy. She writes about culture, food, and climate with an emphasis on how our culinary habits and traditions are shaped by political and economic forces. She has a great weekly newsletter called From the Desk of Alicia Kennedy, that which has over 16,000 subscribers. And so great to have you here, Alicia. And next we have uh, Isha Dattar, the executive director of New Harvest, which is a nonprofit research institute that funds open public research on cultured meat. Uh, she's been a pioneer in this field for many years, and she actually coined the term cellular agriculture. Um, and she's been uh, a, a great food uh, friend to Food Tank. So thanks for being here, Isha. I'm also excited to talk to Dawn Sherman, who is the CEO of Native American Natural Foods Tonka Bar. She is a founding member of Tonka Resilient Agricultural Co-op, a South Dakota collective dedicated to returning bison to lands and improving the lives and economies of Native communities. Um, I had a chance to moderate her a few years ago on a panel, and I learned how important buffalo are to, to to communities and also to enhancing biodiversity and protecting the environment. So it's nice to see you again, Don. And last but not least, we have Gabrielle Rosenberg, who is an associate professor of gender, sexuality, feminist studies, and history at Duke University. His research investigates the historical and contemporary linkages among gender, sexuality, race, political economy, and the global food system. So, so nice to meet you, Gabrielle. Um, I want to set some ground rules for today. I'm going to give all of our panelists a chance to further introduce themselves with the with the opening question that a Alex mentioned earlier. They'll each have about seven minutes to answer those questions and talk more about their work. And then we'll have a, a discussion, which I hope is based on their responses. Um, we'll take questions from the audience, as Alex and, uh, said before. And I encourage you all as panelists to build on what one another says disagree politely if possible and ask one another questions um this is meant to be an actual conversation so i hope we, we can make it uh, really invigorating and, and useful to the audience and i also encourage you to use the hashtag tfss 2022 and the hashtag food tank if you'd like to share your thoughts with us on social media 
So Ridge, you're up. I'm going to start with you. And I'll, I'll just repeat the question a little bit paraphrase that Alex asked before. What does me mean for your work and what sorts of values does it embody? And what values inspire your work on meat? Hello, everybody. I'm thrilled to be asked to be part of this panel. I think my prejudices will become clear fairly quickly. I'm all for beef. Um, here's my contention. We can save the planet if everybody would eat more 100% grass-fed beef. This is actually the title of a Time Magazine article about 10 years ago. Uh, the world is taking its time getting caught up. Anyway, I've juxtaposed these two pictures. On the left is the feedlot. 97% of the beef in this country is finished on a feedlot. And on the right, 3% of the beef is pasture finished. My contention is if we do it in the pasture on grass, we sequester carbon, we fix the water cycle, we create nutrient dense foods, and it's great for jobs and justice. Next slide, please. So it's about biomimicry. You know, we're gonna hear later about the buffalo, but we've all heard about the buffalo. And it's really about the how, not the cow. So, you know, there were 60 million buffalo on the prairie. There were eight foot deep soils, tall grass. It was a pretty awesome scenario. I asked people, how do you think that happened? You know, you think the prairie was perfected and the 60 million buffalo parachuted in? It was really a symbiosis of the buffalo, the photosynthesis, the soil, and the grass. Today, we have 60 million cattle and we have dead soils and feedlots. And I'm gonna spend some time on what's not right rather than what we could be doing. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, corn, the way we grow it is unhealthy for the cow, the planet, and for humans. This is my contention. We don't have time to talk about this, but the picture on this slide is a feedlot. So cattle are typically on a feedlot, you know, 100 to 150 per pen, a uh, total of 10,000, 15,000 animals that stay in this environment for three or four months. The corn comes in on those trucks, gets fed to the cattle. There's all kinds of problems with this scenario. It's called a CAFO, feedlot, whatever you want to call it. Next slide, please. <clears throat> but when you go track it way back, the real problem is the corn. So we have 97 million acres of corn grown in this country. And when you plow that prairie, carbon in the ground wants to oxidize, wants to become CO2. That's what it wants to do. So we plow all this land and then we bring fertilizers. Now we're understanding the fertilizers come from Russia and Belarus by ship. And we take it to the Midwest and put it on this ground. Then we use biocides, we use herbicides, glyphosate and fossil fuel to do this whole thing. And what happens is we basically kill the soil, we kill the microbes in the soil, we kill the biology in the soil, but this is at a great scale. And um, the corn and soy that's grown is subsidized by our tax dollars. About 40% of it goes to feed livestock, 40% goes to ethanol, another insane thing that we do. And the rest goes into corn syrup and into our food system. Next slide, please. So this is just a quick picture to show you uh, the green on this map shows you where human food is grown. The red shows you where corn and soy is grown. So if you look at the states of Illinois, Iowa, and Indiana, the old prairie, 97 to 100% corn and soy, which goes to feedlots. And if you look, they're on the Mississippi River. Um, <clears throat> so this is... Um, this is where we're at. I tell people, you know, I could stop the flooding in Mississippi, I could cure the drought in the West, and I could cure human obesity. You just have to give me the three states of Illinois, Iowa, and Indiana, and a big herd of cattle, and I can fix those problems. Next slide. So before we leave the feedlot, this is a picture we zoomed out. On the left are all the pens with 100, 150 animals. We bring the grain from the Midwest, fertilized by fertilizer from Russia pour it through the cattle, and what happens to the nutrients? They end up in this lagoon, and they can't go back onto the corn land. Then periodically, the lagoon breaks, and this uh, nutrients go down the Mississippi and create the den zone in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. Next slide. 
<clears throat> so to get away from the, the negatives, the potential is that we could mimic the buffalo with cattle over great areas of the country. And what we do is we do it with an electric fence. We move the cattle in big groups on grass and grass only diet. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so the, uh, the cattle love this. The cattle are happy. The cattle are healthy. We use no antibiotics, no hormones, and we can do this over big, big areas of the country. We could eliminate the CAFO, the corn, and all the negatives by raising cattle on grass. Next slide. This is uh, just a, uh, <clears throat> a quick slide that shows, uh, if you go to our website, there's a video. And this guy has done a perk test on corn land, extensively grazed land, and the way we do it, which is called adaptive multi-paddock grazing. And what he's discovered on the corn land, he pours the water into this thing and measures the percolation. It takes about 30 minutes to percolate. So the corn land is like macadam, and this is whole states and whole watersheds that cannot absorb the water. He goes to the extensively grazed land, dramatically better, seven minutes to percolate. He goes over to the adaptive multi pad grazing the way we do it, and it takes about seven seconds to percolate. <clears throat> the reason it percolates is the ground is porous because it's absorbed water. The water infiltrates, the water goes back into the system the way you learned in, in uh, junior high school, how the water cycle should work. And what the peer reviewed research is showing us is that by grazing like this, we increase the biomass per acre three to six fold. So it's really a more remarkable opportunity to take all that land, put it back into grass and raise beef. Next slide. So this is just a quick slide showing uh, <clears throat> two farms in Australia. The father died. He left each half of the farm to two sons. One son did the uh, adaptive multi paddock grazing on the left. The other son followed the uh, conventional agricultural practices. So the son on the left created 20 inches of topsoil in 10 years. I mean, this is remarkable how fast we can put the carbon back into the soil, get it out of the air, with a real simple system, no technology, no factories, no geoengineering, photosynthesis. It's a simple time proven methodology. Next slide. This is cattle, 650 head of cattle moving to a new paddock in Vermont. So this is the finishing process. This is the model that we're trying to um, go toward. Really, uh, this is entirely possible. Healthy cattle, they love it. Next slide. <clears throat> and this is a picture of Mark and uh, Cheryl, who are the people that run that farm in Vermont. So these are all the benefits here. You know, jobs, it's humane. There's no antibiotics, no hormones. It's clean, um, and it's healthy. <clears throat> and what we're finding is that when you have healthy soil, it makes healthy grass, which makes healthy meat. Um, and, you know, all these benefits, fertile soil, storing carbon, and it protects against drought and floods and all those things, which are huge problems. Next slide. <clears throat> and this is kind of where I'll end it. Um, you know, the, the, the challenge, and I've been at this for about 50 years, is to figure, to get the, the eater to understand that they have a choice. And I love this quote from Wendell Berry, eating is an agricultural act. I think it's absolutely true. And I have another quote from some folks, David Montgomery and Ann Bickley, who've done a lot of research in this field. They have a book coming out this spring. And what they say is, you know, we all understand the phrase, you are what you eat. Their contention is you are what your food ate. So I'm gonna just leave you there with that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Rich. That was really great, very informative. I'm glad you uh, focused on the positives. Magali, you're up next. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk. 
I am Magali Licoli. I am originally from Mexico. I grew up in Leon, Guanajuato. Leon, Guanajuato is the capital of shoes. But I also grew up going to Michoacán because that's where most of my family lives too. Michoacán and Guanajuato were one of two of the most affected uh, states in Mexico when the um, the North American Free Trade Agreement was signed into 1994. Uh, and I remember going to, to Michoacan, growing there, uh, visiting my family, and I saw how little by little these towns became ghost towns because most of the people were affected by this. The NAFTA were pretty much the fields died in Mexico and people were forced to immigrate to look for better jobs uh, to feed their families. And I saw how also my family had to immigrate from Michoacan to the US and I immigrated to the US in 2004. When I came to uh, Arkansas, I, I lived in Springdale, Arkansas. I learned that a lot, a huge population from Guanajuato was living in, in, in the state of Arkansas. Back then, I didn't really know um, much of the, uh, of the jobs. I had to learn that while living here, but I also like to, to make a pause to say that I had a different experience immigrating in the US because I had the privilege of going to the university to learn English as my second language. My background is theater. I was doing theater in Mexico uh, since I was 15 years old. And so whenever I graduated in 2013, uh, I began working in the nonprofit work world uh, and I was working in a community clinic two blocks far from one of the biggest Tyson's plant in Springdale. Dur during, while doing that job, I was assisting the immigrants and nationalists uh, to get into uh, a health uh, like a, because they didn't have health care, we had to place them in different programs that the nonprofit was offering to these workers, to these people. And while doing that job, I was, uh, it was the first time that uh, all the stories of poultry workers came into my eyes. It was like an eye opening to learn that the stories that I heard when I was in Mexico of people immigrating to the US for a better life it wasn't not like that. It was not as, as perfect as they wanted to be because they, yes, they had a job. They, they were able to feed their families at some point of time because these workers were seen as expendable that once they got injured, they were finding ways to get rid of these workers. So I learned that the majority of the community living in Sprindle were people that were like around 40, 50 years old that were not able to work anywhere else because of the injuries that happened at the poultry plants. And doing that job, I learned that, yes, the people immigrated to the US, they found jobs and were wage, but they even have a dignity. They stole their dignity while doing these jobs. And I said this because for me, it was shocking to learn that workers that were working at the processing plants at some point were fired because they had accidents that lasted for life. So these workers didn't have any healthcare insurance, they didn't have any resources, and they have to pretty much go in into uh, nonprofits to help to get the resources, food, uh, uh, medicines, because many of them had accidents with chemicals that affected their lungs for life and that they weren't able to find other jobs. And to me, to learn that was shocking because to me, it was not only one case or two cases. It was, it was a systemic issue that was happening in that community, in my community. And when I spoke out about this, with the leaders in the community, with the nonprofit uh, people, I found out that nobody wanted to talk about this. I found out that this, it was purposely done by these companies and that these companies like Tyson Foods is the home uh, of Sprindle, Arkansas, 
They were able to control the community by giving charity to the nonprofits, to the schools, to the clinics, to the churches. And so these workers pretty much didn't have any community support because all of these nonprofits were taking money from this corporation that that was creating this cycle of poverty, you know, that these workers were uh, placing these jobs and white rural communities where there is a lot of anti-immigrant laws and that these workers are not welcome, you know, uh, in these communities unless to work. And so many workers uh, that are working in this industry come from Mexico, from El Salvador, from Central America, many immigrated from, uh, from California because these companies were paying bonuses to people to bring workers. And so they ended up in these white rural areas in Arkansas with no community support and with these companies exploiting them to the, to, to the point that they didn't have any other option once they were fired. And to me, uh, back in 2013, when I began learning about these horrific stories of poultry workers, it was a moment of me being angry, but it was also a moment of like, we need to, to take, we need to, we need to do something about this. It was like me, my responsibility of now that I know, we, we cannot again avoid this issue anymore. So I began doing this work of me not knowing anything about labor or organizing workers, but I knew uh, I was an actress and I had this, uh, this, this sense of like, we have to change this reality and we have to empower these workers for them to be able to speak up because these workers were too afraid and are too afraid to speak up because nobody here support their, their, their support them. And so I, uh, I began doing um, organizing workers with popular education, with art to, and it was a sense back then of like, nobody can't uh, against these companies. And it's true, like we are going against the waves, big waves, because these companies have gained so much political power, social power, and that pretty much Arkansas is a right to work state, but we also are a, a corporate state where these companies dominate everything. And so actually right now, many people tell me, Magali, no, why are you doing this work in a corporate town? Because this is how it, it is in corporate towns. But why do we have to normalize something that it's obviously inhumane? Why do we have to say, yes, these, these corporations are here, but these people are here. These people are also part of this community and these cor corporations should be held accountable for the atrocity that these communities are forced to go through in order to feed the, co the country. And so in 2019, finally, we uh, formed Benceremos an organization led by workers and I built it with poultry workers, mainly women, because the majority of the workers processing the, the chicken are women that are forced to, uh, to, to process at a higher speed. You know, back then it was the, the line speed was at 145 chickens per minute. Workers were not allowed to go to the bathroom. Workers were forced to use uh, diapers because they were not granted enough bathroom breaks. Uh, workers were getting injured and without any resources of not attorneys to, who take uh, workers' comp cases. There is no ways to, um, to hold these companies accountable. And we saw that pretty clear during the pandemic when, as, uh, as it was mentioned, the unveiling of the uh, inhumane and everything that is the broken system of the food, uh, the meat, uh, meat system. And so pretty much during the pandemic, we saw that in a, you know, a, a, it was, I've seen workers being terrified of speaking up, but, but during the pandemic, it was a moment that they were terrified, but they were more terrified of dying because they knew sure. that these corporations were 
putting them to get sick and die because for them it was mostly important the prophets with the excuse that these were essential workers and they had to remain in their jobs so absolutely whatever- Magali I hate to cut you off but we need to get to the other speakers and I want to get into some of what you're talking about later on in the discussion but I know so many labor organizers who come from the the arts community so it, it's so inspiring to hear what you're doing with Vincent Ramos and and that now that you have this responsibility that you know what's happening that you feel this responsibility to change it so thank you for sharing that story with me and and with all of our 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 audience uh, alicia you're up next and i'm sorry if i've mispronounced your name uh is it alicia or alicia alicia <laughs> nice to see you go right ahead nice to see you Great. Well, so because I'm here as a food writer, I decided to focus on that in my in my prepared <laughs> remarks. Um, and so, you know, as a food writer, I'm expected to eat everything. I'm expected to have no prejudice and no restrictions, and I'm expected to eat widely and greedily. But I haven't eaten meat in over a decade, and so I'm an outlier. And in my work, I center a vegetarian perspective. Um, that's my critical posture or positionality, and my pr- Critical posture also prioritizes pleasure cooking and the significance of the kitchen. Um, The vegetarian food writer continues to be a rare species. So I think a lot about how normalized abundant meat consumption is among food writers. (laughs) Most post pictures of fried chicken to their Instagram stories. And I remember everything about the taste of fried chicken, you know, the salt, the pepper, the crack of skin giving way to moist flesh. I haven't eaten a piece of fried chicken in a decade, but it remains a part of my psyche, you know, will I ever forget? And would it mean something to forget? I ask myself and, you know, it happens a lot. Someone posts prosciutto and I remember eating wheels of it that were rolled up with mozzarella from Costco. Um, And I remember, you know, always going to the kitchen to get one more piece of that. Um, Someone posts a rose con pollo and, uh, you know, my mouth fills with that essence of sazon and a burst of pea in the rice. Someone posts a barbecue pork rib and I recall the sweetness and smoke, the slick of fat, my teeth touching bone. You know, I know what all of it tastes like and I remember it vividly. Meat was at the center of my plate growing up and I took a lot of pleasure in it. I remember those foods and I do what I was taught in meditation classes. You know, I see it, I honor it and I let it go because there is nothing that could ever get me to eat a piece of meat again, save for some hypothetical conditions of being stranded and starving. The mere thought of putting a piece of meat into my mouth kind of makes me gag. Um, This is for reasons of personal ethics, ecological concerns about the impacts of industrial agriculture and the abysmal labor conditions of meat processing plants. I I don't know how most people do it, how they meet posts to use climate writer Emily Atkins parlance and meet meat with abandon. I don't even want to fake eat meat eat. Protein isn't the center of my eating, yet I don't lack for it, though many press releases (laughs) tell me I need more that I need some specific planet saving protein. I read about a company in Japan that will have a seven centimeter by two centimeter steak ready by 2025. I read a 2020 academic paper that says the production of a thick piece of meat like a real steak from cellular agriculture is still a dream. My freezer is stuffed with samples of a soy based meat that I gag thinking about eating similarly to how I think about eating real animal meat. While I've got, you know, I'm always marinating tempeh, I'm always pressing tofu, I'm always eat, making a pot of beans. Um, and so it's, it's, it's an interesting place to be now as a vegetarian food writer, because I started this, you know, way before there was such an abundance of alternative protein, you know, but I also kind of am aligned with, you know, conscientious omnivores, my friends who use every bit of an animal, they make schmaltzy cabbage, they make duck fat fries, you know, I myself, as I noted, I'm a vegetarian who eats, I eat local eggs, some local cheese produced here by small farmers in Puerto Rico, but that's more, more or less the extent of it. Um, the conscientious omnivore vision isn't the one gets online most of the time time though, and it occasionally drives me to climate despair. Um, What would convince people to be, especially in food, to be more openly vegetarian, more to use a dreaded term plant-based? You know, why does being nonchalant about eating meat still have such a high status in in the food world? What would convince food writers and influencers to sometimes suggest it's okay not to eat meat at every meal? What would cause there to be good vegetarian and vegan options at the hip restaurants? You know, how do we adjust the narrative on what food is worth eating, essentially, taking into consideration ecology, labor, and welfare? 
I have a whole book about what it means not to eat meat in a Western meat obsessed settler colonialist culture coming out next year. But to do that, I also had to write a chapter about what meat means in these cultures, though I never wanted to. I always wanted to write about what it doesn't involve animal products. And the only thing that changed that was the way tech meat like Impossible Foods Burgers and Beyond Meat kind of came onto the scene. And despite my commitment to vegetables, I was tasked with untangling what these meat facsimiles meant. But I don't eat these products and I don't care about them beyond what they represent. To me, they represent a continuation of meat as symbol and a center of diets that I find troubling because I personally want to see a radical reimagining of how we eat, how we use land, how we think about our food. It's also true that dairy, shrimp, chicken, and other livestock have awful impacts on the environment in addition to abysmal animal welfare and human labor conditions. But yet it's also true that livestock agriculture isn't created equally around the world, that it provides needed nourishment and more to local ecologies and economies for millions of rural farmers. There needs to be more nuance in the conversation. But food media at large does not take climate change seriously, not really. So there's no nuance in the conversation. To my perspective, it's two-sided, where the issues that plague meat are mostly ignored and meat replacements are you know, lauded as the way forward as a silver bullet to save the world. Last year, Epicurious decided to stop making new beef recipes, which was a bold choice. And I hope that conversation broadens and deepens into some of the rest of the issues with the food system beyond beef. You know, at least they're saying something, anything, but we know it's so much more complicated than that. And the focus on beef specifically and protein broadly hasn't led to good or real changes in how our food system globally functions. You know, the food system could hold us back from ever achieving global warming goals if nothing changes about how we use land and what we eat, which is why all the meat posting and angry reactions to not supporting industrial agriculture make me feel sad, frustrated, ineffectual. And how much do progressive seeming food writers have in common with the right wing when it comes to the symbolic function of meat? Uh, why is eating meat with abandon getting a thumbs up at every point in the political spectrum when it comes to the food media? And so they also remind me to get back to work, to cooking vegetables, baking vegan cakes, my book, and I'll keep imagining a different world where no meat, animal based or otherwise, is the focal point of our food system and food discussion. Wow, you brought up so many great questions. I'm glad you mentioned the nuance. That was really informative. And I hope we can get into, you know, whether alternative meat or the, the beef that Ridge mentioned earlier can really save the world. So thank you so much. Isha, you're up next. Thank you, Danny. Um, I'm also so excited to be here. Um, I'm calling in from Edmonton, Alberta, which is one of the northernmost metropolises in North America. So I'm really interested in this bison versus cow topic. So maybe that comes up in the discussion. Um, but I'm calling in today as the executive director of New Harvest. Um, for the past 10, well, nine, almost 10 years, I've been running this nonprofit organization, which is committed to the idea of go growing foods like meat um, from cells. And the kind of big vision that we're working towards is a world in which um, foods from cells becomes a new subsistence strategy for the world. Just like our transition from hunting to agriculture some 12,000 years ago, to me, it feels like a natural progression that we would be farming cells for food. Whether that happens in the next 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, I think is something up for debate and discussion. But this idea that we would shift this new way of growing food to me seems like an inevitability. And I'm coming here today through a somewhat long journey of discovery. Um, I have a background in cell and molecular biology, and I decided to take a food science class, specifically on meat science, um, in the fourth year of my undergrad degree here at the University of Alberta. And it was in that degree that my professor, a poultry science professor, introduced us to the idea. Well, first, he told us what the impact of meat is on the world. And I was completely blown away growing up in a oil and gas place, realizing the environmental impact that animal agriculture has in the world, just seeing the numbers in terms of how many animals we slaughter every day and feeling almost betrayed that I had thought of meat and farming and agriculture as something that was kind of in a cyclical circular relationship with the earth when actually the way that we have been farming animals for the past several decades is nothing like that. Um, so I initially thought, okay, we're all become vegan, which I still think is the, the best, easiest idea. But um, a few weeks later, I realized, you know, that's been a message for thousands of years and 
can my voice really add anything to that when there are so many other incredible people and organizations working towards that. So uh, a few classes later, my poultry science professor again mentioned the idea that maybe one day we would grow meat directly from cell cultures instead of from animals. And I felt like that was a awakening for me because it just felt like, you know, the way we have been farming food over history has always been towards more food and smaller amount of areas, like smaller amount of space. And it felt like if the, our relationship with meat is already so abstract, such that we consume, you know, so much boneless, skinless chicken breasts that are actually disgusted to see like a, a chicken's foot at the grocery store, that maybe we should actually abstract the animal altogether and produce those products directly from the cells. So to get to the questions that uh, Alex sent out earlier, he asked us, what is the significance of meat to my work? Um, for me, um, meat as we know it today is kind of like the holy grail of cellular agriculture. And that's acknowledging that meat is so complex. Um, it has such a complexity in terms of its actual structure and its flavor and its taste. And also the human mouth and nose are some of the most sensitive sensors in the world. So recreating meat as we know it is going to be a very, very tough task. And I think of these animal products as really the holy grail. But I hope that in this discussion, we can talk about there's many different products that we can create before meat as we know it. And maybe there's a a new type of meat, not as we know it, that has to happen before we can get to those uh, simulations of steaks and so on. Um, and then the second question to answer was, what values inspired my thinking, writing, and work? Um, lots of values, but I think the one that sets us apart is our commitment to openness. Um, that means openness at, at kind of all levels, like on one level, I, my perfect vision of a world with cell cultured foods is one that really resembles brewing or fermentation, which are you know ancient biotechnologies where nobody owns them, anyone can participate in them. And as much as you can grow your own or ferment your own food at home or brew your own beer, um, there's also companies that do that too. So I'd love to see a world in which there is actually complete openness in cellular agriculture such that anyone could participate in it and investigate it and ask questions about it. Um, but I also want to add openness at the level of discussion and discourse. I think that's very crucial to the advancement of science. And then openness in terms of transparency, which I think is very important in a field that is starting out so privatized. Uh, we do need openness when it comes to accountability and safety and all the things that can really de-risk what these technologies could become. So very happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isha. And I'm glad you brought up these issues of transparency and accountability. And I'm so glad you shared your journey with us because I think uh, it's always interesting to hear people's sort of origin stories. And, and it's, it's really interesting to hear, you know, like the epiphany you had uh, when you were a student. So thank you for sharing that. Dawn, you're up next. All right, thank, thanks, Danielle, and uh, just amazing um, to hear everybody else and to follow such amazing people. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Matakiape, my relatives. Hello, my name's Don Sherman. I am the CEO of Native American Natural Foods, and uh, we are the creators of the first uh, original authentic meat and fruit bar um, called Tonka. And I uh, also do, I'll quick take a step back, wanted to recognize that I am sitting on the Kickapoo Comanche and Wichita lands currently right now. Um, I am a member of the Lakota, Shawnee, and Delaware tribes, which are from South Dakota and at the East Coast. Um, Native, American, Native American Natural Foods is uh, best known for our authentic, original, award-winning Tonka bar. So many of you may have heard of it. Um, and we also created that meat snacking category. Um, and this is from a traditional yet innovative recipe that we have used in our um, with our people for since the beginning of time and since Buffalo, uh, we have used uh, Buffalo. So we call this Wasna. So it was not only the first Buffalo bar made from uh, 
buffalo and cranberries, but uh, we modernized that recipe to create this category, which the category you will know today when you go into those grocery stores is the meat uh, snacking category. Um, so you'll see many other items that are on that uh, slide. Um, our mission at Native American Natural Foods is to heal the people and our Mother Earth by building a company that innovates new food products uh, based on our traditional values of Native, Native American respect for all living things by by living in balance with mind, body, and spirit. Sorry. <laughs> Um, our goal at Native American Natural Foods and Tonka is to return buffalo to the lands, lives, and economies of our people and our communities. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. Um, the company Native American Natural Foods uh, was founded 14 years ago in the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. And it was it's a land-based legacy brand that was driven by our social mission and authentic story. We were shaped um, out of the reservation by two community members, Mark Tilson and Carlene Hunter, um, who was approached by the community to come up with um, what to do with the buffalo that was being raised on the reservation. Uh, now, Pine Ridge is in the southeast part of South Dakota. It's 2.9 million acres, um, just to kind of give you an idea. And that's about the size of, Del of Delaware. Um, Pine Ridge is a, a food desert and does act, lack access to healthy foods. So the creation of Tonka Bar wasn't just out of a want, but also a need and a necessity. Because um, in our um, in our culture, food is medicine. Um, we call that pajuta, and um, so food is what you know keeps us healthy. It keeps the land healthy. Um, and with that knowledge, we reached out to the community to find that solution, and that's uh, what you saw today. The fact that Buffalo and Ridge, I appreciate you recognizing the, the Buffalo in your presentation. That was wonderful. Um, it's very intrinsic to the recipe Wasna, but um, it's an illustration of how important it is to um, the company, but also our culture. Uh, it is our creation story. We're sister nations with the animal. So we are always an honoring and respecting that animal as we move forward. And secondly, also just um, for, so everybody knows buffalo is a keystone species to this land and it's um, part of the carbon sequestration and move forward movement as uh, I, I will show you in the next slides. <laughs> next slide, Alex. <laughs> um, what we did is we created um, a healthy line of bars and bites um, from that recipe. So as you, uh, you can go online and find us and you can, uh, we're in uh, many retailers across the nation. Um, and you'll see that it is um, gluten free, made from the buff, uh, buffalo with sweet tart cranberries on that recipe of wasna. And what wasna means, I've used it a couple times, is it's a unique uh, way of us where we would take the dry buffalo and we would take a high acid fruit, um, such as choke cherries or buffalo berries where we're at. And a wasna literally means all mixed up. So we would pound that with a stone, um, stone to stone, and we pound the dry meat, pound the cranberries in there, and then we would layer the organ fat on there and then put it in buffalo horns. And that is what uh, preserved that meat. So not only did we modernize this uh, way of preserving meat naturally, because our, our bars are all natural, it allows our products to last 18 months. So like our ancestors, you know, we have a means to survive when food becomes scarce. And we've all had that feeling over these last several years, seeing these shelves go empty. So having another source of protein um, besides the frozen and the fresh uh, section, this allows that meat snacking category to feed, feed forward. Our, uh, to kind of give you a feel of what the product tastes like, um, it is, it's gluten-free, like I said, all natural. It's, uh, when you bite into it, it's tender, smoky, and sweet because you're going to get the uh, saltiness and the smokiness from the meat and the smoke in it, as well as the sweet from the cranberries. So that, you know, that benefits the ancient tradition for today's healthier lifestyle. And for the audience, um, just to kind of let you know here, it's more than about food for us. I mentioned pejuta, which means medicine. Um, it, and it's more than a brand. Um, we've always looked at food, you know, to heal the mind, body, and spirit and our land. And this holistic uh, view with the buffalo and with our culture and our life ways is part of our past, present, and future of our Native communities. We're always looking forward into the next generations. Next slide. 
Um, so in order to take this holistic view, you know, we created an economic model at Tonka. Um, not only the bar that you'll see, uh, Native American Natural Foods and buying that value added, um, we created a model that will bring back this keystone species to the buffalo and back to the American grasslands. Ridge had um, recognized, you know, what the Great Plains had looked like at one point. And um, in order to move forward, what I always say is you do have to recognize the past. And um, since the beginning of time, basically the people on the Great Plains, which uh, one of us is me, Lakota uh, or the Sioux Nation, we have been spiritually united with the Buffalo as a sister nation. The creation story explains that we were born from the mother earth out of the sacred Pahasapa or the Black Hills as many of you have heard, and we emerged as Buffalo. So the, the reason for that Buffalo are sacred to the Lakota and they give, they're the givers of life. Um, it was our basic, it was our basis for our traditional economy. It provided the food, the fuel, the toys, the housing, the clothing, the medicine, and all the life lessons that we needed to be resilient and how to survive forward. So in turn, we have always protect, protected and honored them in prayer and in practice. So that is one reason why this, the meat and the buffalo are so important to, you know, our company, but also in our uh, decisions as we're moving forward. We thrive for generations on that. So as one, one of the strongest uh, part is, you know, is keeping the, those buffalo, uh, bringing them back to the land and to our people. Um, also, just at, in the beginnings of the 1800s, uh, Ridge had mentioned, you know, there was 40 to 60 million buffalo, as, you know, on, on the Great Plains. And it is also has been recognized that it was the first and largest corporate dis destruction of regenerative sustainable food system. The buffalo were annihilated to make room for cattle and subjugate the Native American people, specifically the Lakota. So we do have to recognize that, you know, this was an animal that should have been on the land, but was brought back to subjugate the Indians, the Native Americans. It, but it's also the first species that was sent uh, from the brink of ex uh, extinction to approximately 600,000 animals today that you'll see on the land. Most of that, those animals are on ranches um, in over 60 tribal areas. There are national parks and in conservation herds across the country. So the emerging buffalo market is tiny when you compare it to the industrial meat market because um, it has been um, overflowed with more cattle. Um, but the interest in buffalo as a heart healthy, low fat, clean and grass fed um, option is, you know, where we're moving forward. Um, <clears throat> our goal, obviously, you know, our traditional native telling, telling stories, we try to be truthful, you know, as part of our uh, the part of Tonka Bar, Native American Natural Foods, uh, with our create creation story, we, we tr use regenerative and holistic and traditional agriculture practices to help return the bison back. Uh, the one facet about building, uh, you know, an agriculture business is the holistic view and the value added goals. For instance, you know, we bring in the, that producer or that caretaker back into the line, because as you see the meat uh, prices rise, the producer is usually the one, the person that's taking care of the land and the animal taking care of the land is the, the last one to receive, you know, the benefits of that economy. So part of this model that you see is more of a braid, as we would call it, with uh, the for-profit, the nonprofit, which is Tonka Fund, which will bring uh, funds directly to the steward or the caretaker of the animal uh, to raise the buffalo. And then Tonka Resilient Ag, which is fairly in the new stages, is the collaborative of the producers. So they have a market to directly take their animals into without having to um, use the normal uh, cow calf type operations, as I would say it, um, they would be able to keep animals on the land a little bit longer. Uh, we provide uh, land access capital and technical assistance to them. So creating this bridge, it um, represents long systemic change. Uh, it took a, a several a hundred years to get here. It's going to take us a while to move forward. Um, and the food system does need change it, you know, it is a model that, you know, we want to continue to invest into our future and to our children. And I'm going to leave it there and thank you guys for uh, listening to me and uh, taking a, uh, me taking a journey with me and find us at at our website. Yep. Thank you so much, Dawn. I love that you you talked about it as it's this modern snack, but the the values and traditions of your people are so embedded in it. And I think that storytelling is so crucial to where the food system needs to go. We, we need to hear those stories so that we can create a, a better future. So thank you for sharing all that. Thank you.
All right, and last but not least, we have Gabrielle. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I hate to be the, uh, the person keeping us from what I think is gonna be a really phenomenal conversation. Um, but I do, I do have some thoughts um, to share uh, before we get to that exchange. Uh, first and foremost, I wanna thank the organizers and the other panelists for being here. This is um, really exciting. And so far, I think uh, I've already learned a lot. I'm excited for the rest of the conversation to come. Um, I'm gonna preface my comments, which are in response to the prompts uh, with two big pieces of context. And so the first one is just um, a broad statement that I'm not gonna offer a lot of evidence for today and you can evaluate it on the basis of uh, whether or not you think it's plausible. Um, but I see meat as an increasingly central symbol in America's culture wars. Um, one that has a privileged role in organizing anxieties, optimism, fear, passion, and anger about human relationships with nature. Um, I expect that as global climate change intensifies, that tendency is in fact only going to increase further, um, particularly as reactionary and potentially eco-fascist forces seize on the promise heretofore actually conceded by most liberals and leftists that cheap meat is a basic consumer entitlement um, without which notions of the good life um, are seemingly impossible. Okay, if that's the political context, then um, I wanna set the stage for uh, the intervention that my kind of work delivers. I should say first and foremost, um, my training as a historian, um, I'm a historian on the one hand of environment and agriculture, but I'm also a historian um, of race, gender, and sexuality. Um, I teach though in a program in gender, sexuality, and feminist studies at Duke. Um, and I'm writing a book um, on the history of livestock breeding and relationship, the development of human race science and the human eugenics movement. My department um, now and historically has had a standing focus on feminist theory in particular. I think that we may be in fact the only department in the United States that offers a graduate credentialing process specifically in feminist theory. I could be wrong about that. Someone, someone can fact check me if I am. Um, but feminist theorization um, is thus really pivotal to how I think about political conflicts. Um, and I, I, I personally find three longstanding analytic emphases of feminist theorization to be particularly useful um, in thinking about the politics of meat. Um, and I would go so far as to say that I, I think they're also really useful in thinking about the phenomenon that I mentioned in my first piece of context, which is the increasing sort of symbolic centrality of it in American culture wars. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to radically oversimplify these things, and not all feminists uh, certainly agree, but I think these are three things that I take personally from feminism as, as important analytic contributions. The first one is that many feminist theorists contend that all politics is reproductive politics, and that therefore economies are also reproductive economies. We have to include accounts of reproduction in any account of a political economy. Uh, fundamentally, the erasure of the work of reproduction or reproductive labor is going to be a central part of how reproductive processes um, are commodified and ultimately become sites of extraction and exploitation. Um, so one of the things that feminist theorization encourages us to do is um, to draw attention to these reproductive processes and the ways in which they function within larger social structures, those that are formerly extractive as capitalism, um, but also certainly within structures like racialization and class, which aren't necessarily reducible to, uh, to economic actors. Second, traditional liberal theory has tended to relegate um, emotions, feelings, and sentimentality to what is sometimes characterized as a feminized domestic realm. Um, denying that those things do or ought play any role in authorized political debates. Um, but in fact, feminist theory, by contrast, um, has often emphasized the critical role that affect, fantasy, feeling, narrative, and desire play um, in political outcomes. Um, and so the argument here is that we actually need to pay attention to those things, um, to how fantasy um, structures political debates, how it, it structures political formations. Already in today's sort of event, um, we've heard a lot about optimism and fantasies of the future and worlds that we would like to make. Um, that, that work of fantasy and the work of, of dealing with those um, uh, desires and attachments um, is really central, I think, to the work of feminist theorization. Third and finally, I wanna call attention to the tradition within feminist ethics that has em emphasized the importance of compassion, empathy, and a recognition of shared vulner vulnerability um, as the basis for moral concern and moral work. 
Um, this is a charge that has productively expanded who or what we can be relationally tied to, which is a major point of emphasis within um, ecofeminism, uh, indigenous feminism, and black feminism, um, as well as to the centrality of animalization um, as a part of the violent administration of race, class, or gender sexuality um, under capitalism and settler colonialism. Um, so I want to call attention to that, that the importance of thinking with compassion, empathy, and recognition of shared vulnerability um, as, as being really fundamental to, to, to what many feminist theorists would sort of assert is our foundational ethical charge. So given these analytic points, I'm going to assert that I'm drawn to meat in particular as a central object of concern, precisely because it reminds us of the shared vulnerability that we often recognize but do not honor with respect to that which we classify as the non-human. These vulnerabilities are organized by two horizons, the social processes that draw us into and out of life, what we call birth and death, and how we traverse the space between those horizons, the processes that draw us through life um, are the work of politics. Because death and birth are thresholds that cannot be experienced, um, at least not as most, I think, American consumers would understand them, um, they are also objects that tend to be overwhelmed by fantasy and desire, which in turn invests meat with a kind of affective charge. Eating meat is thus a visceral reminder of reproductive processes, often violent, that are organized to draw us into life, um, as well as those processes by which um, life uh, faces attrition and ultimately uh, departure. So therefore, meat is a reminder of the needs that must be satisfied to sustain life and therefore also to stave off death. Um, it is a reminder ultimately that we are meat. So that's going to turn me then to two larger sort of analytic points um, with regards to the conversation today about the future of meat. I'm not going to do any prediction. Um, I think there's a lot of conversation to have maybe about some of the claims um, with regards to, to ecology and environmental science that we'll be having in a little bit. Um, but I want to call attention to maybe a little bit of a shift in focus. Um, the first one would be to say that the sensationalistic brutality of the slaughterhouse, um, which often figures centrally into discussions of meat, tends to crowd out other important analytic frameworks um, about how animals might be harmed or exploited through the processes of meat production. So a preoccupation with killability, the question, is it right or wrong to kill an animal to eat it? may obscure how the profitability of meat production increasingly depends on a kind of totalizing commodification of the life processes of animals, a reality that should turn our attention to their enduring status as reproductive and metabolic workers. That is, they are creatures that do work in the world, and we do not tend to honor them as workers primarily because um, the grisly sort of end um, that we find animals in in the, in the slaughterhouse uh, tends to, to uh, make us think of them only as objects um, uh, of our own desire and for our own consumption. Second and finally, and I'll conclude on this, um, it is something of a hoary cliche at this point to say that the ultimate political stakes of meat are so monumental, precisely because humans too are meat. Um, but I think that the reality is that technological advances and things like gene editing and synthetic bio bi biology are only actually going to further blur and confound um, efforts to distinguish something like an edible animal from sacred persons. In other words, um, the barriers between what is eatable and what is not, what is edible and what is not, um, that, that depend upon, rely upon, and invest in the notion of species are increasingly uh, coming under um, pressure and are ultimately fraying because of these technological advances. So in light of this, I would sort of argue for and would hope us I would hope that we can sort of consider um, what I would term a multi species labor politics, um, that is to turn back to the prior point. Um, to consider animals as reproductive and metabolic workers to ask therefore as workers, uh, what kind of vulnerabilities do they share with us. Um, and then perhaps um, to, to ponder, um, as feminist theorist Kathy Weeks has argued, um, what an anti-work politics might look like, um, at least as it incorporates um, that multi-species sort of uh, essence. And in fact, um, our, in, our inability to, to sort of ground these kinds of uh, distinctions and differences um, along the lines of species um, suggests to me that that multi-species politics, multi-species labor politics is going to be all the more essential in the coming, coming decades um, if we want to want to have some kind of progressive or, or effective left-wing sort of response uh, to the reactionary investment in meat 
um, uh, cheap meat in particular as a consumer entitlement. Um, I'll leave it there and, and thank everyone uh, once again for the conversation. I'm, I'm really excited to hear uh, what other people think. Thanks so much, Gabrielle, and especially thank you for the reminder that we are all meat. It's, it's especially important during this discussion to, to remember that there is so much to unpack here. So um, we're going to spend the next 20 minutes or so with a discussion among the panelists, um, some questions I have, and then we'll turn to questions from the online audience who I think has had a lot to say. So I think um, Ridge and Isha, I, I wanna start with you both, if, if that's okay. Um, Ridge, you know, you made some very sort of um, interesting and sweeping claims about the, the role of, of grass fed meat and, and how it can save the world. And Isha, you know, um, you look at the future of meat uh, and cellular agriculture as a way to, to save the world. So I'm wondering if you can both expand on that. I know that's a very broad question, but I, I think, you know, you're both making similar claims and coming at it from very different angles. So Ridge, maybe if you could spend a minute or so talking about some of the, the um, you know, uh, the, you had a lot of stats, you had a lot of interesting information and there, I think there's been some pushback from the Q&A about some of the, the claims that grass fed meat can it be done on, on such a scale and in such a way that it, it could turn things around in, in terms of how we think about the climate crisis, how we think about economics and labor, et cetera. Yeah, well, um, yeah, absolutely. There's plenty of land. You know, if we took all that corn land, put it back to grass, we get three to six times the biomass per acre, and we could do it. Um, the uh, you know, it's interesting. A couple of questions in the chat were about pork and chicken, and what's fascinating is that pork and chicken are both monogastrous. They have to have grain to function cows are ruminant. They have a four part stomach and they can make their whole living as well as buffalo on grass. So that's a huge distinction. So the, the pork and the chickens can't do it without grain, but the but the cattle can. And <clears throat> yes, there's plenty of land if we converted um, all that corn land back to grass, there, there's plenty of land. Actually, you know, we, um, Lynn and I have written a book that'll be out in the fall, Promise the Grass Fed, and it 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 goes through all that stuff. I mean, <laughs> absolutely, there's plenty of land to to do this if if we if if the consumers get sure. the, could get sure. their head around. Well, and if the investment is there, and if the policy changes in such such a way that we remove some of the subsidies that have prevented this, Isha, precisely, precisely. Isha, Thank you. Isha, you know, you, you talked about sort of this natural evolution from the way we do agriculture now to to cellular agriculture. And I'm wondering, you know, how you obviously think that's very possible, but I think there are probably a lot of skeptics. And I, I wonder what you say to those skeptics. Um, I'm a skeptic too, actually. <laughs> I, I think it is very possible, but the amount of work that we need to do to make that possible like actually possible is enormous. And there is a, a very possible outcome that this doesn't work and that we find out that the economics don't add up. And, um, you know, we, we kind of saw this happen with biofuels before where we're like, oh, we can, we can grow the alternative to fossil fuels. And that kind of came and went just because you could not compete with um, fuels that we dig up from the ground. And so there's, what I love about cellular agriculture is that it is incredibly complex. Um, like there's so many things that have to be unpacked for it to work. But the, the reason why I think it's a potential solution is because, first of all, I don't think it's, a, it's the thing that will save the world if everyone eats it. I don't think we have to change the whole planet so everyone's only eating cell cultured meat. But my argument is very similar to Ridge's about how this becomes a means to perhaps take agriculture off the land a little bit. You know, we already dedicate uh, one third of our planet to farming animals for food. If we could alleviate some of that land, then other means of feeding the world become a lot more possible and a lot more feasible. And I think what the kind of interesting thing about cellular agriculture is, is that it actually does have this momentum of capitalism behind it. 
So I actually think it has this power to disrupt animal agriculture as we speak on those terms of BC investment, funding, talent, mm -hmm. and all those kinds of things in ways that vegetarianism and kind of the nature-based solutions and even reducing our meat, which we should never forget about, um, are as valid, very useful processes, but just don't have that momentum behind them in the same way. So my hope is that Salag actually works alongside these things to kind of just change our relationship with animals in general. Right, and, and really change our relationship with how we see the food, our, our food and agriculture systems really working and thriving and solving actual problems. So thank mm -hmm. you, you both for, for explaining that. Gabrielle, I noticed you have your hand up. Would you like to jump in here? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think I'd like to respond a little bit to some of the things that Ridge said, um, if that's possible. Um, I wanted to, to, to go on, uh, um, and, and, and I'm not an environmental scientist, and there are environmental scientists I know that are in the, are in the Q&A and, and, and that should probably uh, leap in. Um, I think I saw that Matthew Hayek was here. Um, Matthew had done a, a study um, that directly contradicts, as a matter, matter of fact, um, some of Ridge's claims um, with regards to whether or not there is, in fact, adequate land in the United States to be able to sustain the American diet on the basis of, of uh, grass-fed beef. Now, it may be the case that what Ridge means by that, and, and Ridge can certainly clarify for himself, um, is that uh, what he's talking about is that there is adequate land to in increase the amount of grass-fed beef if we totally eliminate uh, calf-fed beef. And, and that may be the case, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily know, but the thing that I want to emphasize is that there certainly is not adequate uh, grazing land in the United States to sustain all grass-fed beef at the current levels of consumption. It's simply, right. there, there, is, there really is no uh, peer-reviewed scientific evidence for that, and there is a considerable amount of peer-reviewed scientific evidence that that's false. Regardless, the other thing that I want to say here is that Ridge also kind of deploys a certain uh, fantasy structure. Um, I, I just want to note that it's like, like this is a wildly sort of utopian and, and um, optimistic vision for the transformation of the United States. I don't have a problem with optimistic utopian transformations. We may well need that. The thing I want to say, though, is that it's an incredibly cramped and narrow vision. Um, it, it's a vision that, that depends upon a kind of like a false history. Like he's saying, like, turn Indiana back to the prairies. Ridge, I'm from Indiana. It wasn't a prairie, like it was forests, it was wetlands, there weren't buffalo around. Uh, like, like there's this, there's this, ex there's this like typical kind of like uh, cattle rancher sort of ideology, which looks at all spaces out there and just sees them as places to stick more cattle ranching. And that's the whole process of settler colonialism in the past, which I really think Ridge doesn't have, uh, at least as far as I can tell, much of an appreciation. I, I think that's too bad because I think a lot of like, points that, that he and I might have a shared uh, sort of sensibility around, but I, I really need to, I really need, need to, to maybe like encourage him to, to sort of texture and, and, and back off and offer a little bit of uh, less of a totalizing vision of, of cattle everywhere um, and in all places. I, I think that's, um, that's sure, not really gonna help the cause. Thanks, Gabrielle. I have to give, I wanna get to everyone here. So Ridge, I, I need to give you a chance to respond, obviously, um, just very briefly, if you can. I will be, 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 be brief. Thank so, you. Uh, you know, I was uh, driving uh, from uh, Pennsylvania to Illinois. I drove all day. So Indiana is no longer trees, please. <laughs> it is corn. And so all day I drove from uh, through Indiana, through Illinois. And it was very bizarre because as I drove along, the corn had not been planted. But I saw no weeds in the fields. And on the median strip, they were out there, you know, uh, <clears throat> cutting the grass. And it, it dawned on me that this whole breadbasket of our country was dead. No weeds will grow. If I go to Manhattan, the weeds will grow up through the Macada. So it's a long time since Indiana has been trees. And, and now it's all corn. So, you know, in, in terms of the reality of today, you know, corn is the essence of Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa, and it could be changed. That's, uh, that's my contention. 
So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Rich. Appreciate your response. Um, Magali, I want to come back to you now. And you you mentioned a lot about dignity um, during our our your your remarks, the, the conversation we had earlier. And I'm wondering if you actually think it's possible to make meat processing plants where you know the 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 speed of the line is so um, intense, where workers are are treated as expendable, even though they were considered essential workers during the pandemic. Can we make meat processing plants like the ones that Tyson runs places of dignity? Yes, thank you for that question. And and as we have heard, I mean, the whole meat system is broken, you know, it just is not sustainable. However, as, as we are not an Ethiopian uh, vision, you know, that we know that in order for that to happen, it needs to happen all these pieces in order for us to have a sustainable food system or meat food system. Uh, In order, like in our vision, we know that what we can do is to try to do whatever we can to hold these companies accountable. And in our journey to find that, you know, that the current solutions like the government is pretty much, pretty much abandoned these workers. We saw that very clear during the pandemic that we cannot count on the government to assure that these workers have a dignity in their jobs because the line speed keep increasing and the USDA is pretty much on the side of the corporations, of the needs of the corporations, because we are in a corporate country, we are in a capitalist country Mm -hmm. that only cares for profits and not pretty much for workers and humanity. So what we have found in our journey to, to try to to hold these companies accountable, to have more um, that regulations on the line speed, on the chemicals, on the brakes, and all of that that workers are suffering right now, is that we ended up traveling to Imokali, Florida, and learn about the worker-driven social responsibility model, which is a a proven strategy that pretty much uh, goes with the supply chain of these corporations and force them to adopt a code of conduct that will pretty much give them the the human rights to workers and for worker-led organizations to be able to regulate alongside these workers because if it's not driven by workers, it's pretty much is not gonna land into the reality of of, of the workers, you know? We have the corporate social responsibility model that pretty much is PR. Uh, that doesn't do anything to protect workers' rights. So what we are trying to implement is a model that is driven by workers Mm -hmm. and that has accountability and and solutions to to solve the problems and to prevent them. I love it. And I love that uh, you mentioned the Imokali workers and and the the model that they have created, because I think it is a model that other other workers uh, should be using, other worker organizations should be using. And and, um, you're right that it has to be driven by the workers themselves. So thank you so much, Magali. Um, Dawn, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk more about um, Tonka Bar's goal to return Buffalo to the land the lives and the economies of of people. Um, You know, our conversation today is so much more than about meat. It's about values, it's about culture, as we heard before, it's about so many things. And if you can talk just a little bit more about the significance of, of the rearing practices that Native communities use and how those can be, you know, sort of shifted into into the future as well. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Danny. Um, I appreciate the question. And yeah, um, really, and what I'm hearing from everybody is, um, and I'll kind of use a cliche word, it takes a tribe. Um, there's not one solution here, whether it's cows, buffalo, cell, it, you know, it takes everybody. And part of it is looking into the past again to look forward. Those practices were already there. So when you look at the indigenous culture and the, the people that were originally on this land, those were the, what we practice. You don't take more than what you need. You give back, you take care of the land, um, you know, using um, how, how we grew corn with beans and the three sisters and then um, with uh, packing the wasna, so on and so forth. Every native culture has a way to preserve meat, whether it's fish, 
uh, elk, um, buffalo, you know, whatever, uh, turkey, whatever was there, we had a way to do it. There's wasna that goes clear back to the Egyptian days, um, which is a preserved meat that was still good. So those practices were there. When, when uh, we were colonized and the buffalo are gone and you brought in cattle, that's when you started seeing the crop and you know everything, uh, the farming and taking away the top. So to look back, look, the solutions were here. Mm -hmm. Bring more of the indigenous people to the table and listen to them um, you know, and shake that up. Uh, in DC right now, we have very uh, several native leaders that are looking at, um, and you know, again, this is a systemic issue, you know, that has come since the lands have been colonized. So, with the leaders that we have right now in DC, listen to them. Definitely voice your opinion. What's going on right now? We do have some leaders there on the Buffalo Act um, and things such as that. So, uh, when you're looking at and our part is that's what I say, bring us to the table, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. have that knowledge and continue to use utilize that having cows act like buffalo. That is, you know, a great step to move forward and making them uh, regenerate the land and the soil since buffalo are keystone species they naturally do that with their hooves and the wallowing and they don't eat, you know, they don't eat through the uh, roots and they're not eating the flowering. Uh, they bring back all you know the whole ecosystem that they they do to regenerating uh sequester carbon is you know you start peeling that layer of what the buffalo do to the land it's amazing um but you know buffalo is one solution and um we continue to look for current solutions and also full car you know when we talk about the slaughters full carcass utilization it's not just about meat there's other things there to utilize that we can you know have value added um, solutions to that because as they are being harvested, I don't like to use the other word that everybody's using. Sure. Um, you want to honor that animal. This animal has given up their life, what, no matter what type of animal that is. We have to honor them, whether they're in the pens or they're out on the grass. Um, you know, this is what is keeping us alive, whether, you know, how we're growing that food and moving forward. So it takes a tribe, everybody to make one little change in being sustainable and regenerative and then talking to the people that have um, that are working it right now in this food movement. Absolutely. I love what you said, uh, this idea of going forward by going back and looking at those traditional practices. And you also said something very important about bringing more native folks to the table, bringing more farmers and ranchers to the table. They have to be part of these conversations and they've often been left out and, and especially native folks. So that, that's a really important um, uh, uh, point. Thank you so much. Um, Alicia, I uh, Alicia, I want to turn to you. You know, you talked a lot about um, your distaste for alternative meat sources. And I'm wondering, you know, if you can sort of explain a little bit more about the, the, the alliance that you hope uh, comes from vegans and vegetarians and, and conscientious or conscious omnivores coming together to bring back maybe more more whole foods and 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 instead of you know these sort of uh tech foods right right i mean yeah i i am one of those advocates for a whole foods plant-based diet whether that incorporates the kinds of of meats that other people here are talking about that is a uh, that is up to them um I and Alex just asked a great question in the chat about reducing overall beef consumption at the same time as as shifting the food system toward better better processes and better practices. And I I think that that is something we really have to grapple with, which is that you know uh, the average American the estimates are around from like 220 to 250 pounds of meat per year um, in the last, since the, you know, it kind of peaked in 2015. And so the question has to be, you know, how are these alternatives going to fit in? Are they going to, you know, I think it's recommended, I've seen the number between like 50 and 90 pounds of meat per year um, is recommended consumption. You know, is, is the purpose of alternative meats to produce at a rate that, that, closes that gap between like healthy consumption and the kind of excessive consumption we already make or is it going to replace what could potentially be the the healthy level of consumption which is would be under 100 pounds and so you know for me the the question is always going to be this kind of marriage of um production and and culture where we have to make those align and 
And it means that the culture is going to have to shift to decrease consumption. And yes, maybe there are these other alternative points um, that are created. But when you're talking about impossible or beyond, you're talking about monocultures, you know, and, and, and you're talking about high levels of fertilization. You're talking about, um, you know, a lack of biodiversity where you're growing those. So is that something we want to do in order to meet the demands of the meat consumption? When we're talking about cellular agriculture, you know, are we getting away from fossil fuels as an energy source in order to make it truly sustainable in a way that um, aligns with our goals? Um, and, you know, I would love to hear about from Isha the, you know, new ha harvest is an outlier in terms of cellular agriculture, in terms of its transparency, and it's seeking like an open access to that process. And she talked about, you know, the that there is capitalism behind cellular agriculture right now, that is where the money is. But at the same time, you know, is that is that necessarily a good thing when we have like lots of the big meat companies buying up alternative protein companies um, like Cargill has its hand in it, JBS has its hand in it. You know, are we going to really if the money is behind it and these big businesses are behind it, are we going to see the changes that we want from in from this space, from this arena? You know, a, a new harvest obviously being a, a better, <laughs> a better version of these companies. Sure. But you know, sure. if if the if the money is behind these big companies, then what what is really going to happen? Interesting, Isha. Do you want to take a minute just to respond? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, <clears throat> um, I <laughs> I feel like more negative than neutral about the fact that the momentum of capitalism is behind it. But it's, I say it more as just spelling out that it's a fact, not really trying to bear judgment upon it. And then trying to say, you know, if we have this movement and momentum behind it, how do we steer the technology to be the best version of itself? And honestly, in the end, it's probably going to require things related to policy. And you mentioned Alicia about um, like overconsumption and someone asked a really great question about, shouldn't we be decentering protein from the center of our plate? And I think that's absolutely true. Like I think reduction kind of has to be at the center of all of these solutions. It's just that question of like who advocates for reduction. And that's probably even less of a capitalist frame than like any of the people here today. So, I, you know, I just want to point out there's also this concern about Jevons paradox where when you make a, a technology or an outcome more efficient or lower cost, it actually leads to you consuming it more such as when power came down, we started running our AC all day long and our fridges were plugged in all day long. You know, that that's something that kind of keeps me up at night too, is like, if we are thinking about efficiency and oh, we'll alleviate land, how do we know that alleviated land will be used towards uses that are better? Mm -hmm. So I think as New Harvest, like I, I don't actually think we're like the better version of anybody because we're just different. Like we, we, our, we are tasked with these questions of what will the market not solve? And these are the kind of big questions that I don't have the answers to, but hopefully yeah. closer to them eventually. Yeah, I mean, and soon, yeah. and soon. Yeah. Absolutely, the, yeah, and soon. The urgency is really there, but you know, nobody has all the answers right now, but I, I, again, the urgency of solving some of these, these problems is, is really, resonates with me right now um, as we as we look at what's happening in the world. Gabrielle, I, I want to turn back um, to you because um, and, and if you could just take I want to get to questions from the audience. So if you could take um, just a few minutes to answer this. So you, you mentioned a lot about sort of this the societal demand for inexpensive meat. Um, and, and that makes it really, really hard to implement policy changes. Um, that can move us away from industrialized meat production. And I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on what kind of policies could really make the, that happen? What kinds of incentives do we need to, to make that happen besides removing subsidies and some of the other things we talked about earlier? Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, obviously, uh, I think those are part of it. And I mean, the, the irony here is that I think most of the members of the, of the panel would probably agree on some of the the fundamental sort of like policy shifts with regards to, for example, ending subsidies for ethanol, um, decreasing the amount of, um, of land that's used uh, for, um, for corn production. Um, I think that like broadly, my, my uh, sort of approach to this is actually, and, and I, don't, I apologize because it's gonna seem like I'm, I'm pitching, uh, picking on Ridge more. Um, and and I, I feel like I was already- uh, You already did. <laughs> 
I'm gonna grab, I'm gonna grab there's a line, a line that was on Ridge's uh, PowerPoints, which was uh, eating is an agricultural act, which is a famous line from, uh, from Wendell Berry. And um, what I'm gonna say about that is that I actually think that that's um, a fundamental part of the problem. Um, that, that one of the ways to think about like how we alter the story around meat um, is to stop thinking about it simply as an agricultural problem, but also as a problem of large scale industrial, environmental and labor policy. Um, and, and so just to, like as a simple question, like there's, there's agricultural policies about things like land use and, and how land is regulated, um, whether or not we're growing corn on it or whether or not we're using it for, for grass like fried beef. And, and those are all good questions, and I don't want to suggest that they aren't, um, but the belief that this is only about farming is a huge, huge problem. Um, you know, just at a very basic level, the work that's done, for example, to, to organize um, all of the various laborers um, who, who are working in slaughterhouses, like a lot of those are questions of labor. Uh, and and it's, not, it's not conceptually like coherent to think about it as agricultural policy. So I actually favor reorienting our institutions in a way um, that recognizes that the problem of food is something that isn't reducible to the problem of farming. Mm. And that the, the sort of like this emphasis of that you're an eater and therefore it's an agricultural act and there's this sort of one-to-one -one between eating and agriculture, um, is not a very good fit for the particular food system here in the United States in this particular moment, that, that it requires a much broader policy framework yeah. that integrates labor, environment, um, uh, a, a wide variety of different sort of regulatory approaches. Um, and so, you know, it is really great to be on um, uh, a panel um, with Magali. Like, uh, I, I think that that kind of work that is addressing laborers um, as laborers, not necessarily as farmers, but as laborers, um, like that's incredibly important. And, and I think that it, in some senses, all of my recommendations around this are going to be about that kind of um, trying to find solidarity within the food system without making it simply reducible to, uh, to something called agricultural policy. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. We do need more solidarity in the food system to be sure. There, so I wanna turn now to some of the audience questions. And there's one from uh, Professor Matthew Hayek at NYU, which is my other favorite university in addition to Tufts. Um, and he, uh, Matthew has a, a, a kind of a simple question. And uh, Magali, I, I wanna start with you um, with this question. Do you support the reduction of overall meat consumption? Would that help the workers that you're helping to organize? Well, I mean, it, I mean, I think it definitely the mass production, it's a problem, you know, I don't know uh, how much of that is really uh, food that people consume, it's just the, the, the need of producing more is affecting definitely the workers, you know, and the, the lack of regulation, the line speed right now workers I, I've spoken to workers in different plants and all workers right now are working while injured and without any uh, ways to have health insurance because these companies have uh, control the medical side, you know, all the poultry plants have nurses and all these nurses keep lying about the, the real condition of the real uh, health mm -hmm. of workers. So these workers ended up just having taken Tylenol and to keep working and working because these workers are seen as expendable. That right. really is not sustainable, but right now, I mean, you go to the store and there is no meat, you know, and, but somehow there is a lot of waste of meat that we don't the people don't consume so I believe it's more the problem of how corporations have gained so much political power yes. and how this country and and corporate America is not favoring humans is not favoring people is not favoring immigrants or refugees and so more and more we are going to be seeing more refugees coming because these companies are eager for vulnerable workers that they keep it they keep that so that they keep exploding them. Absolutely. So I'd like the other panelists to also uh, address this question around whether uh, we we need an, an overall reduction in, in meat consumption. And maybe Dawn, you can take that on next. 
Yeah, happy to. Um, and thank you, Matthew, for the question. I, I, he's definitely had some great feedback through through this. Um, I, I, one thing I, I want to do is talk about, you know, is the nutrition. And obviously, I always go back to my people and who we are. Um, just so you know, Native Americans were the tallest people in this nation before we were colonized. Once we were put on the reservations and given rations and taking commodities from the government, we are now the shortest people in the nation. And that was done in two generations, just so you know. Wow. So when we talk about this, this shows how important food is to our communities and to our people and to the nation and how we responsibly take care of it. So, you know, and most Native Americans, you know, beef or, or I shouldn't say beef, bison or fish, you know, that was part of the diet, but we were also harvesters and foragers. So a majority of our diet was plant based with the injection of uh, whatever protein was there. So, you know, we are, you know, a lot of Native Americans are lactose intolerant because we did not have milk, you know, so on and, you know, and we still have those genetics in us. So, yes, I would be, you know, I'm in favor of reducing the meat um, on that side because we have to have those concern, you know, we have to conserve the animals and I, I'm speaking buffalo, you have to have those con conservation herds, but right. to responsibly conserve them, you have to eat them. So for the pure, you know, people that don't eat meat, you got to understand you can't just let them grow and grow and grow and grow and then they just get out of hand. You have to responsibly take care of them. So yes, that, you know, it's, and it, that's part of our culture. We ate plants and vegetables and fruits as well as protein. But when protein wasn't there, we couldn't catch buffalo or fish or whatever that was. The, the base of our diet for months would be what we foraged and harvest and dried for the seasons. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. Ridge, what, what are your thoughts? Ridge, are you still with us? Did Gabrielle? Uh, yeah, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm here. Where do we start? No, uh, so, um, uh, you know, I agree completely with Don. Um, I I I don't think buffalo are the answer, uh, mainly because buffalo are wild. You know, I have, a, I have a son and I would put him with any cattle any day of the week, but I would never put him with a buffalo. <laughs> buffalo are wild. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> but you know, at the end of the day, uh, um, it does seem like, um, you know, I, I've, I've been reading the chat and there's lots of comments about the grass fed beef. And the, the reality is, yeah, maybe we should eat less. But the, but the fact is that, and the research is just coming out now, that the phytonutrients that are generated in grass fed beef from eating grass in all the we haven't even done the research. It's just remarkable what can come into the human diet between the minerals and the vitamins and the uh, phytonutrients. And it, it's just stunning. You know, this new book by David Montgomery and Ann Bickley, it, it, they've done research on um, <clears throat> adjacent farms that are growing cover crops and not cover crops and the nutritional difference in the food. That's before they even add in the ruminant, the cattle. I mean, it's just stunning the possibilities that in terms of human nutrition that we could obtain by doing this. So I don't know if that answered your question, Danny. That's okay. <laughs> Ridge, could you do uh, everyone a favor and put the name of that book in the chat if you have a moment so folks can, can look at it? I think that would be helpful. Uh, yeah, it's going to be, um, you, 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 are, you are what your food Eight. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ridge. <laughs> Alicia, Alicia, sorry, I keep messing it up. I, <laughs> I think I know the answer <laughs> to to this question, but I want to come back to you. Do you support the overall reduction of meat consumption? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like yep. my whole my whole life is about that. Um, yeah. I mean, I there is no reason to get more complicated about it than that. Like I, you know, I have this very complicated, I guess, like perspective as a vegetarian, but and that people get mad. You know, I'm vegans get very mad at me all the time for even, you know, for ever saying it might be okay to eat like an egg from a chicken that your neighbor keeps and is their pet or something. You know, like vegan, they hate it. They hate it. And so, um, dealing with that is, you know, and so uh, if for me, yeah, it, it's that's, but that's the crux of my life is, is getting, trying to get people to eat less, eat, eat less meat, eat no meat, and also to learn how to eat 
really just fewer animal products in general through through like fun things like vegan baking and 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 just thinking about things in that way to get more creative so that that to support that overall reduction and hopefully just get people away from industrial animal agriculture any way I possibly can. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alicia. <laughs> um, Gabrielle, you're next. Try not to, to pick on Ridge too much this time. It's hard. We have a little, <laughs> a little more cattle colonialism there, claiming cover crops as, uh, as, 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 as pro cattle. I don't know. I don't know. We'll let other people uh, dive into that. I, I also uh, fear to make this be more complicated than it needs to be because yes, 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 we, we need to be less <laughs> mean. Come on, come on. Like, come on. Uh, we all know this. Uh, I, I think everybody on the panel knows this and probably everybody on the call knows it. Um, I am going to make it more complicated because that's my job. Uh, sure. and, and that is to say that like one way of thinking about this is that there's been this huge, huge shift in the ways in which uh, sort of human uh, dietary consumption has has changed in the last three centuries, uh, where meat has become more and more central to the diet, particularly in the global north and places like the United States and Europe. Um, and that has actually made the food system in a fundamental way profoundly less efficient um, because it's about routing energy through plants, then into animals, then into human bodies. Another way of thinking about that, and this is the way I would want us to think about it, um, is that's about um, creating the conditions for overwork. Mm. Um, animals are overworked, right? That's that's what we're doing to them. We're 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 using their metabolic labor to run corn and, and and grain and grass through them to create this thing called meat, which is an incredibly inefficient way to gather calories um, from the broader sort of like ecology uh, and, and the broader system of, of, of energy transfer. So, look. But the way I would think about it, and I said this in my very prefatory comments, is that I want us to think about a multi-species anti-work uh, sort of politics, and it's right there for us. One of the reasons why we need to get away from, from eating as much animals as we do now um, is precisely because that's a system that overworks the environment, it overworks the animals, and it results in overworking humans as well. Uh, everybody should work less, and they should get paid more. That's, uh, that's my politics right there. Thanks so much, Gabrielle. Uh, great, great answer to that question. Thank you. And thanks for not picking too much on, on anyone else. Isha, you get the last <laughs> word on this particular question. Rich can take it. Rich can take it. Come on. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I say, um, I say bull, you know. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, I, I asked Isha to speak next, so okay. I'm going to give the floor to her. Um, I, I feel like I've already kind of spoken to this reduction being so necessary, but I, I loved how Don earlier said we should take what we need. Um, and I think that there's a nutrition angle to that question, but I also think there's like this planetary angle to this question. And I'm, I'm just feeling like we are reaching these like biological limits with our planet when it comes Absolutely. to like animal agriculture. And so everyone here is coming to the table with some solution that kind of changes what those limits could look like. And none of them are really possible without reduction at the center. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So eloquently said, if the organizers are okay and they can uh, ping me if it's not okay, I'd like to ask one more question from the audience. Um, and so this question I want to pose to, to Dawn and Magali, and it comes from one of uh, our, our viewers on the the opinion around humane slaughter is there such a thing as humane slaughter and what does that look like and so dawn maybe you can take that on first okay and i'll, I'll make it quick so Magali can get her chance um yes there, there you know in our tradition there is you know the way we harvest them traditionally it you know is humane um but when you're talking about humanely raised and um when we go to our plants for bison bison's a little bit different than than cattle so um, they are usually harvested within 24 hours of receiving it. We we try not to transport them over, you know, 400 miles, you know, based on those uh, humane standards. So, and uh, the plant that we utilize is, is in the Rocky Mountains, and he's very responsible. He's one of the top um, producers within in the na nation, um, and he's very careful about how they humanely handle them. So, yes, I would, you know, the plants that I know of and that we use 
it is a long, um, you know, there's a lot of changes going on in the industry because of the, the stress on the meat market. People want to open up a new plant and new plant. Again, it has to be a holistic view, you know, see what's out there and talk to those and see what they're practicing. Because um, with us, our partners are important. And, you know, a partner such as that, that harvests them humanely, um, they handle not only the animals, but their laborers, you know, and, and their actual business um, in general. So it's still all about those values. Yeah you know, our partnerships are important. So um, we do value that. So yes, there, there is a humane way to do it as well as, you know, there's talk on the field harvesting too with bison. Um, there is some field harvesting that's done to, to stop the transportation and the stress on the animal also. Thank you, Don. It, it does go uh, back to the, those values that are so important and, and what Tonka and Nita and, you know, you're doing with your, your company. So thank you. Um, Magali, you know, we talk a lot about humane slaughter for animals, but it's often a, I mean, it, it, I'm not saying anything that n no one else thinks, but this is very hard on humans as well to to work in a, a processing plant for, for many different reasons. And I'm wondering if you can talk about, is there a way to do this humanely for humans? Yes, uh, and I also like always to, to say that all the animal uh, rights people that sometimes accuse workers of killing the animal don't really think about how the workers, I, I always said like none of the poultry workers when they woke up and say I want to, I want to, I woke up today and I want to kill these thousand animals because that's what I want to do in my life. That's not how it is. I think uh, we need to stop blaming the workers for how animals are being killed right now because most of the time that when I speak to the workers about this, all the time workers tells me we are treated worse than the animal that we are killed, you know? And I think that we should be uh, mindful of that. Like these people are people, humane people that don't deserve to be treated worse than the animal that they are being killed. Uh, and so, yeah, there is ways to, to obviously to regulate this industry. You know, I think that most of the industry and only 20% of the uh, industry is unionized. Uh, so there is no ways for workers, the workers don't have power. And so all right now, the companies have the most power and that's why they, being, they, they treat these people as expendable, as trash. And so I think that, yes, yeah, the work that we are doing is very important to empower workers to continue holding these companies accountable and to set regulations that are more humane to these workers than that is being right now. Absolutely. These corporations, especially Tyson and others, I'm calling them out by name, need to be more accountable to their workers in a million different ways, including making sure that they are safe at their jobs, that there is dignity provided, and, and that they can feel good about their work. Everyone deserves that, right? Um, we have time, uh, I think, for at least one more question. And so the this is sort of a, a, a multi-layered question that I'm just going to um, talk about the end of that one audience member um, asked early on. And, and so they asked, how do you imagine concrete steps to ending industrial meat? And I don't know who wants to take that on first or if any of you do. Well, remove the subsidies, right? Is that the first thing we do? <laughs> and then that changes everything. <laughs> good, good answer, Alicia, anyone Ridge, else? You're on mute, Ridge is on mute. <laughs> Right, you want to take I, I could I could not agree more to to get rid of these subsidies because the sub subsidies promote corn and then we use it to feed cattle, which makes them sick. I mean, I, I could spend an hour talking about sure. the, but the, then then let me ask a question. So these subsidies are in place because of, of what Magali was referring to earlier, the power of corporations. And so if we had things like campaign finance reform and you know, if we could take the money out of politics, that would make sure that these subsidies and, and other sort of unfair practices don't exist. So that's one step. I'm just, you know, that that's more complex because the the meat lobbies and the dairy lobbies and the egg lobbies in this country who are you know really focused on the industrial side have a lot of power and and a lot of money no absolutely i mean and it's been in place since the 1940s you know we we got out of world war ii and we made the munitions into fertilizers we made the tanks into tractors and we went crazy 
And then there's all this corn and then what do we do? Farmers can't make any money, so we subsidize it. And we end up today with this cheap corn. I mean, people tell me all the time, well, how come the grain fed beef is cheaper than your grass fed beef? It's a freaking subsidy. <laughs> That's the yeah. only reason, you know. Absolutely. Uh, do others want to comment on this? I know, I know that you all have opinions. I, I knew Gabriel was going to be next. Go ahead. But we like I, I agree with Rich on, on subsidies with uh, Alicia as well. I think that's uh, that's dead on. Um, the question is is partially like what's the political strategy for for building that kind of movement? In other words, for offsetting the the sort of political power of large agribusinesses. And um, one of the things that I go back to is that um, part of the problem, I think, within sort of food systems reform, sort of linking back to what I was talking before about thinking about food systems as purely an agricultural policy problem, is that it tends to fixate on the interests of farmers. Um, and I certainly don't want to suggest that farmers' interests need to be sidelined or, or, or totally ignored. But I just want to note that in terms of thinking about a mass politics, which is necessary to counteract the, the power of, of uh, agribusinesses, um, there are probably somewhere between 10 and 20 times as many uh, workers uh, within the food service industry as there are um, farmers, um, and also in, in addition to that agricultural labor. So there are tens and millions of people who are cashiers, who are servers, who are, are start stocking food at grocery stores. And, and I think that it's really incumbent on us to think about the ways in which we articulate the interests of those workers. And like we, we, we listen to their interests, particularly around wages and particularly around the conditions of their labor. And think about those as central to food systems reform and central to building a political coalition that has the ability to seriously take on those agribusinesses. Because I've got bad news for us. If farmers are driving the tractor, so to speak, there just aren't very many of them. And most of them are actually quite conservative in their political commitments. So I don't think there's a real viable path to a broader, more robust, more equitable, and more just food system if it depends upon a framing that prioritizes the interests um, of people who own farms. Thank you. Thank you, Gabrielle. Well, I think this idea of putting workers uh, as more central to food system reform is, is very, very important. Farmers that I have met um, are, you know, two things. The smartest people in the world. Um, I've, I've never met a dumb farmer. And two, uh, they are people who will change if they see the opportunity there. They will change their practices if they see the economic opportunity there. So whether they're they're Democrat or Republican or somewhere in between, I don't think it matters how conservative they are if they can make money off of doing something that's more environmentally uh, sustainable, more uh, socially uh, just and sustainable, and, and more economically sustainable. I want to, to end on that note because we have three minutes left, and I know that organizers have a lot to say uh, to wrap up. But I want to thank all of you as panelists. You have been this has been such a fun. This is not what I expected at all. I think this has been a really fun group of, of folks. To to talk to you are all brilliant and amazing and thank you for the work that you do and and thank you for your your bluntness and and, and being so honest during this conversation and i want to thank tufts again thank you for including me yeah i just have a, a million thanks to everyone but i want to allow us to close off with some parting words and i'd like to send it over um to our key site of food production at tufts campus that is to say to Patty Kloss, who is a longtime supporter of the Tufts Food Symposium and is the Director of Dining Services. Thank you, Alex. Uh, good afternoon. And I'm excited to tell you about how we think of meat here at, on campus at Tufts, where we serve about 10,000 people a day and expect to see 1.7 million customers this year. Our position is that in the US, we should eat less meat. Over the past four years, we have intentionally reduced the amount of meat we offer on our menus, including de-emphasizing solid protein as an entree. We now use meat more as a component in a dish rather than on the center of the plate. We do still serve chicken and fish and some pork. We do this primarily um, by replacing meats with plant-based proteins. And we do this with the belief that protein is an important opportunity for change to advance healthier, more sustainable menus 
And we'd like to be able to, produce, to purchase these things from companies who treat their workers respectfully and equitably. As menu planners and recipe developers, we look for dishes that feature cuisine and culinary traditions from around the globe and more closely reflect the preferences and traditions of our students and our staff. We're aiming to feature foods from these traditions that are not focused on meats naturally. And we're not really interested in fake meat at this time, uh, at least not what's currently available. As a result, we've learned that we can reduce our carbon footprint by menuing through our menuing practices. We participate in an initiative called the Menus of Change University Research Collaborative, and we participate in a collective impact data report, which identifies food-related greenhouse gas emissions from our protein portfolio. In 2019, when our initiative began, Tufts Dining protein purchases resulted in an intensity metric of 56.7 pounds of carbon emission per pound of food that we purchased and served. But in a year later in 2020, after implementing a number of the initiatives I've just described, our carbon footprint dropped to 32.2 pounds of carbon emissions per pound of food. The MCURC's goal is a 25% reduction by 2030. Now, unfortunately, the pandemic has impacted our menu practices due to changing student preferences. They really crave right now comfort foods, a lot of traditional foods like chicken fingers and, and a lot of things that um, they weren't as interested in before. They're much less interested right now in plant-based foods. And of course, supply chain challenges have also impacted the availability of a number of foods that we want to serve. We are currently compiling our data from 2021. I think we'll have lost ground. Regardless, we remain committed to these objectives. We've only dabbled in alternative meats due to the limitations, including cost and availability, and frankly, concerns about the nutritional profile of some of those items. And we have a preference for cooking foods ourselves, and are focused on uh, minimal, minimally processed ingredients um, and things prepared as naturally and from whole foods as possible. Let me just end by saying here at Tufts Dining, we are available as a living lab for researchers and educators and would welcome opportunities and conversations to explore this together. Thanks. Thank you everyone so much. It's deeply appreciated.